this beautiful morning. Thanks, Jimmy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Canto Conversations. My name is Mark Reynolds. I'm the general counsel at GTT and, and I'm currently a Canto director, and I'll be a moderator for this morning. Now, <clears throat> our session this morning is, is, speaking, is speaking about digitalization of Caribbean governance, governments. And I think just in the process of us coming out of the pandemic, us now emerging, being a digital, digital society with AI, we have to become more alert, more digitally aware. And at the center of us doing this, you don't have to look any further than our leaders, our govern, the persons that govern our respective Caribbean countries. And I, you know, from, from last year at Canto, I met a very passionate young woman by the name of Alexia Peralta, who is the director of the e-governance and digitalization units for the government of, government of Belize. And she spoke with us passion about what has been taking place in Belize in terms of the changes there. And personally, from what I got from her last year, it has just been a, a, a passion point of mine um, in practice is that change must start. It cannot be just from the persons us as citizens, us as persons that are that live within the various Caribbean states, but there must be a collective push. And I think that she is, is going to be able to demonstrate that so eloquently and so vividly in the next, in the next, within the next hour. But just before I get on to, um, to the presentation and introducing to introducing you to our guest speaker, I just wanted to give some, some tidbits about Belize. So for those who may not be aware, the Gib Nut is pretty much, it's a, it's a rodent, but it's also considered to be informally the royal rat, just because when Queen Elizabeth first visited Belize, this was fed to, this was presented to her as a, as, a, as, a, as a local meal, a traditional meal. And it was after then she learned what the Gib Nut was. It also is, and, and based on its based on its based on its culture, based on its heritage, its motto is under the shade I flourish. And for the next hour, we will be under the shade of Belize and getting a cool understanding of what is happening in the in the developments there. Jewel, it is known as a jewel in the heart of the Caribbean basin. It has the third largest living Caribbean Caribbean um, basin, which pretty much means that. It's a very ecocentric community, which is which flourishes on its on its natural beauty. And of speaking of beauty, its national flower is the very rare black orchid. And I've seen it, it's quite a beautiful flower. But let us get into the beauty of what Belize has been doing over the last couple of years. And we'll start with Alexia Peralta and looking into what she has done. Alexia is the director of the e-governance and digitalization unit in the Ministry of Public Utilities, Energy, Logistics, and e-governance. She is a public policy and project management professional whose core duties include policy development, program management, communication, and planning to improve public service delivery, drive innovation, and enable digital transformation. Alexia is responsible for Belize's digital transformation planning and implementation. She previously worked at the public private desk in the office of the prime minister, leading various projects and reforms in the area of sustainable development, e-governance, the building sector, and the financial sector. She also brings practical tourism industry experience, having worked in the Ministry of Tourism and Civil Aviation as a tourism investment officer, where she obtained valuable skills in business planning, biz project design, data analysis, and drafting the technical and policy documents which support the implementation of the, of the tourism national investment agenda and facilitating private sector and multilateral funding dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't see a better person to speak on this transformation because not only is, will she be, can you catch her here, but she also has a very riveting, contemporary and quite interesting podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Ms. Alexia Parenta. Alexia, over to you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that excellent introduction and for really doing a great job in introducing Belize, uh, especially the uniqueness that makes us Belize. Uh, good morning, everyone. If you'll just allow me one second to share my screen. Mm -hmm. 
So once again, I just want to take the opportunity to really thank Kanto uh, for the opportunity to share Belize's transformation journey, what has been our lessons learned in this process, and where we are today, and what have been some of the key um, enabling conditions that we've really taken in order to move towards our vision of becoming a digital Belize. I know Mark did an excellent job in highlighting uh, who Belize is, where we are, but I just wanted to really start with this first slide in highlighting one of the, the key areas for Belize. Um, we are both Central American and Caribbean. We're very proud of that heritage and that blend that really creates a uniqueness to our country. And with that, of course, it does provide various opportunities. Uh, Population-wise, we're very small in compar to, comparison to some of our Caribbean brothers and sisters, uh, but nonetheless, we like to really call ourselves as a melting pot because we have so many diverse cultures that reside within Belize, and that gives us its own uniqueness, its own challenges, but its own opportunities, and that's why you would see there that I've highlighted that we have over 10 languages in country. We have a growing 20% youth population, a very important 53% rural population, and 66% bank, meaning those who actually have a bank account. Uh, why I start with these statistics and why these statistics are critical and important, because when we're talking about digital transformation, when we're talking about the transformation of a government, you're really talking about how we're going to improve the lives of our citizens, how we're going to deliver better products, better services that really works for them, that helps to solve the solutions and the challenges that they have day in, day out. So digital transformation, while we like to think a lot about the digital, it really is more focused on the transformation aspect and how we're transforming people's life and how we're able to really um, provide a new way to support them. So understanding them, understanding the demographics of the country, understanding the uniqueness of the culture and the uniqueness um, of who we are as a people is critical if we want to make sure that we are being inclusive and that we're bringing them along in this transformation process. And that it's not just a transformation process that is led by the government. Uh, Mark said it earlier, transformation requires a holistic approach and it requires that everyone is part of the process. So in the next 25 minutes, I'm really going to, to compact and share with you what has been Belize's journey so far. I'm gonna of course start by going through our past because it's only by understanding our past and understanding the lessons learned that we can truly appreciate the changes that have been taken and how those changes are now going to support Belize's new vision. And furthermore, what are those enabling conditions that we have spent over the last two years pushing forward to really achieve that vision that we now have, which is to become a digital Belize. So let's stay, step back and learn a little bit about Belize's past. I think here, Everyone has heard of the words of e-government, e-governance, digital government. These are buzzwords that we've been hearing uh, for almost over a decade and even beyond that. Likewise for Belize, e-government is not new. Digital government is not new to us. We've attempted this before um, under previous administrations, under previous institutions. And in fact, we even had a policy in 2015 to 2018. Um, so we've been doing work in e-government for a while now. However, uh, in 2020, when the new administration um, really wanted to further push the adoption of e-government in Belize, what we did was we went back and we observed where we were. And surprisingly, we were only at a 25% implementation rate of our then policy. So it had been over a decade that we've been discussing e-government, over a decade of implementing projects, of making various capital investments as, as a government. However, we were still underperforming. And of course, this was something we really wanted to understand as to why were we at that 25% implement, implementation rate? What were the challenges that we were having that really were inhibiting us 
from performing. Um, it's not to say that in that 10, 10 years, we really hadn't implemented anything, but we had done various digital platforms. We've worked significantly in the country's ICT infrastructure, in the telecommunication infrastructure, and it was clearly showing in our international rankings of e-government development index that we had made some major improvements in telecom infrastructure, but yet we were way still behind when it, when it was in the areas of online services. So we were still underperforming within the region uh, and we really needed to understand how can we improve Belize's performance, but beyond that, beyond just trying to meet a target of a measurement of trying to, to be uh, ranked high internationally, it was more about how can we truly begin to transform the government to become one that's more digital instead of just adopting technology, instead of just buying ICT for different ministries, et cetera, how could we begin to transform the way government operates and the operations of government? Um, so we began to, to, to rethink some of our approaches, uh, but however, like I said, it's critical that when you're designing a transformation plan and a new way of doing things that you take a step back and you really understand what are your challenges that you're faced. Um, for us, there were six main challenges that we saw when we were reviewing our performance. One of those was, of course, that there was a weak governance system within country. Um, it's great when, as a country, we know we have that strategy, we know what we want to do, but if we don't have the enabling governance institution to be able to support the implementation, to lead this initiative, to really support ministries in adopting this new way of doing things, then it's going to be very difficult to begin to see that transformation and to see the level of impact being created. Governance is critical and important as a foundational pillar for driving transformation. Another area that we saw that was lacking was having that common vision. We had a policy. We knew what we wanted to do, but there was limited, I would say knowledge, but limited buy-in in why we wanted to do it. Uh, whenever we would ask, why is government having an e-government policy? Uh, the same response would always be, oh, because we wanna use technology. We wanna just integrate more technology. But in reality, that wasn't the vision. The vision was not to simply integrate technology, but to leverage technology to transform the way government operates, to leverage technology to transform the lives of our people. So we realized that we were having that barrier of not having a vision that was really incorporated and really embodied by the entire public sector. We had a policy again, which tells us what we want to achieve, but it didn't give us clear, in, clear directions in how we wanted to achieve it. Um, and as we know, when we're planning transformation processes, or even when we're planning projects within our organizations, uh, we need to be able to answer at least three main questions. Why we're doing the initiative that we're doing, what is it that we want to do, and how we're going to do it. Um, so again, if you think about it, we did not have an institution that could really drive that conversation and more so that could provide the guidance on how the policy would have been achieved. What were the initiatives, the critical areas that needed to be invested in and supported to actually realize some of the goals of that policy. So having a clear roadmap was critical and, and it was a major gap for us that we consider uh, was a challenge in inhibiting our ability to really achieve that policy. Another main area was our weak ecosystem. Um, all of these transformation processes operate within an environment. We're not siloed, although we know those are some of the challenges we also have in government, but the reality is that government operates within an environment, it operates within a certain culture and when we do not consider those uh, subsystems in that conversation, then it becomes again very difficult to really be able to achieve the impact that we want. And in our case, we realized that our legal environment 
was not conducive to supporting e-government and to supporting uh, the adoption of technology. So our legislations were extremely outdated and it needed to be one of the main areas apart from our policy framework that we also supported in improvements. The fifth area was low digital literacy. Uh, again, you know, we at the technical level knew these buzzwords of e-government, digital transformation, et cetera, but how could the citizens uh, become part of the conversation if they didn't even understand what we were saying? You know, we were speaking two different languages. So that began to, be, to become a challenge because if we cannot speak the same language, if we cannot understand, then it's very difficult for us to work collaboratively. And it's very difficult for us to really be able to design products that fit towards the needs because we won't be able to understand what is it that we're trying to achieve. So digital literacy was an area as well that was a challenge for us. And you'll see later on that it has now become a top priority under the new uh, national digital agenda. And finally, um, we saw a major area of government having a culture of government being centric, sorry, government um, centric culture, whereby we really focused on establishing projects and delivering products um, that were only considered from the per perception of the government. What was it that we were trying to achieve? How were we trying to transform our administration processes and not necessarily how we were going to create impact and create value for citizens. So many times we saw systems that were designed and deployed and were the same mirror processes and the same challenges that they had uh, act actually accessing a service physically, just being translated into an online system. So there was no process re-engineering. It was simply taking what we had and making it digital, which we know brings all of its inefficiencies into the online realm and makes it very difficult. Uh, so these were the six main areas from our analysis in 2020 that really told us um, that these were the areas that we had challenges and these were the areas that if we truly wanted to, to begin to see impact and see transformation in the country we needed to immediately address. So that led us to really rethink how we wanted to do digital government in Belize, how we wanted to achieve this vision and what was going to be our new approach to be able to achieve that vision. When we were designing our vision, uh, we really needed to do a lot of research. We really needed to understand what was the global frameworks, where we are at that point when we were discussing, we were still in discussing about e-government. We were still thinking about uh, one-way communication as you can see there from OECD, uh, but really and truly we were behind. Um, and you guys know this now today, we talk more about digital government and now we're even talking about GovTech. How do we take a whole of government approach? How do we simplify? How do we become citizen centric? Um, so we wanted to ensure that our new approach, our new way of doing things really was also aligned with the global framework and that we were also considering other best practices and lessons learned from other countries so that we could accelerate the transformation process of Belize. Uh, because as you heard, it was 10, 10 years of, of really having slow progress and we really wanted to be able to catch up as quickly as possible within the region, but even beyond the region. So having understood the global framework, uh, we, we really focused on five main areas for our transformation process. Uh, we focused on strategy, governance, people and culture, customer and processes. And the objective for us is really to ensure that when we're transforming Belize, that digital and technology is a tool that helps us to achieve that vision. But in so doing, it really becomes the backbone to the operations of government. It really becomes, as we, we highlight there, the digital DNA of the government of Belize, that we think first digital and how can we ensure that digital is a key is a key tool in helping us to transform lives. Why did we take approach? 
Why did we take that approach? Why did we focus on strategy, governance, people and culture, customers and processes? Uh, we took that approach because we realized that when we talk about the transformation of beliefs, we're really talking about organizational change. Um, if we take a step back, governments across the region, we are, never, we, are, we are an organization. We're comprised of different ministries, different units, different departments, but at the core of it, we're still the government of Belize. We're still the government of Trinidad and Tobago. We're still the government of Jamaica. So we're still an organization. And we needed to look at the organization on a whole and how we were going to transform the entire organization. And in order to do so, we needed to recognize that the, an organization is comprised of various subsystems, as you can see there. Uh, it includes not just having a strategy, it includes the culture because the culture really defines how we interact with each other. Um, in our day-to-day -day operations. It even defines what types of assumptions we make when we're designing projects, et cetera. We needed leadership and not leadership only in the sense of um, authority, but leadership in being able to champion and to support this transformation and to be able to support people in wanting to adopt that culture shift. Um, we needed to be able to understand structure and how we're designed in government and how decisions are taken in government so that that can be factored into transformation plan. So organizational change um, approach was really what we began to adopt and uh, began to apply. And when we began to do that, then we began to realize uh, the, that these national digital agendas or strategies are really that transition plan, that transformation plan that takes us from our as is situation in the case of Belize still being very analog to one where we're more digital. So the agenda really needs to speak about how we're going to go from point A to point B, but in order to go to point B, which is the desired future, we needed to know the as is, which is the point A. That's why stepping back and understanding our past, our challenges, as you saw earlier, was a critical main first step so that we would be able to say, um, these are the initiatives that we must take within the time period established so that we can become that digital Belize, which is the digital state for us. So what is Belize's transformation plan? What is our transition plan from analog to our desired uh, vision of digital Belize? Of course, it's our national digital agenda, uh, national digital agenda, strategies, policies. Again, they're not new to us. They're not new to the Caribbean or in the region. We've been having these discussions for many years. Uh, but the uniqueness of Belize, of course, is that our agenda has our Belizean flavor, as we like to say locally, uh, meaning that we've really designed a plan that takes into context and consideration the uniqueness of our culture, the uniqueness of our demographics, and the uniqueness of our governance structure and even our leadership in being able to integrate those aspects and to ensure that the agenda is working within Belize's environment and context and not really working uh, against it or working on assumptions that are unrealistic. So that was a critical step for us. The digital agenda has three main pillars, as you can see there, and it focuses in different areas, not just in ICT, but um, in government, digital government, and, and of course, in digitalization for recovery. I won't go much in depth into the agenda itself, um, but if you're interested, you can always look it up on our website. Uh, we have various summary videos that you can take a look at to see um, more in deep dive into Belize's digital agenda. Apart from a digital agenda, which is the transition plan for government, uh, we have other key policies that have really fed into creating a robust agenda and strategy. Uh, we've from the areas of cybersecurity all the way to financial inclusion. Uh, why? Because again, our agenda, our transition plan is really not about just integrating technology in government, but how we're going to leverage that technology to become a tool for our transformation, to become a tool for us to realize our national development goals, and of course, our vision of one day becoming a digital uh, economy. This is just a very high level image of what is the underlying framework of, of our digital agenda um, in ensuring that and highlighting some of the principles that government is now trying 
to, to really push forward and to meet some of them as our core values, where it need to be data-driven, to be proactive, to be digital by design, et cetera. So all the work that the unit does um, always relates back to these key principles and ensuring that all policies and projects are really supporting the principles and the values that government has now decided to adopt. So now that we've understood the as is, what was our past, we've understood what is Belize's vision. Um, now it's critical that we understand and we take a deep, a deep look into what has been our transition process over the last two years. How is it that we've been able to uh, accelerate some of the work that we've done that in, in the last two years and what have been those enabling conditions that have really supported that process for us? If we go back to the original image where I showed you the digital transformation um, four areas, you saw again that we spoke about heavily about having a strategy, uh, which I just spoke about the national digital agenda, which is really our strategy. It really is our roadmap. It's comprised of many, about over 40 projects that have been detailed into concept papers that really defined what are the activities that are going to be done and who are the ministries um, to participate in that process. And with having that strategy, of course, we learned our main lesson, which was to improve our governance system in Belize. Um, so for the first time in 2020, the administration established a ministry of e-governance. And with that, um, our unit, which is the coordinating entity for the planning and implementation of e-governance in Belize. So we begin to see that we have a strategy. We know what we want to do. We know why we want to do it. We know how we want to do it. And now we are beginning to put in place the pillars that will help us to really drive those three main areas. Um, our unit being the main pillar that really helps now to push forward the delivery of online public services, building digital capacity, improving policy, developing shared infrastructure, and of course, fostering a digital society. Overall, our core mission, as you can see there, is to create public value by leading and supporting public sector digital transformation program to achieve a digital belief. So our mission itself really drives to home that our vision is to achieve that digital belief, and we're doing so collectively uh, with the public sector because this transformation process cannot be led by one agency alone. Um, while, of course, we are the champions that create that wave for the transformation process. Um, it requires the entire ecosystem to work collectively and to work harmoniously in order to achieve that digital beliefs. Another main area when we speak about governance, and again, going back to our, our lessons learned, was really to improve our legal framework. Um, so over the last, Two years from 2020 to 2022, we did significant legal reform with our partners in Economic Development Council and the Compete Caribbean, who really helped us to implement these key legislations. Um, as you can see, we improved in cyber crime, data protection, um, electronic funds transfer, and the latest uh, piece of legislation which we executed with the support of the UNDP is a Digital Government Act, uh, which is the first in the region. And this Digital Government Act is really the umbrella legislation that provides um, the, a clear mandate and a clear vision of how digital government is now a core area of, of the government of Belize. So it has further created um, supportive the legal amendment and the legal establishment of not just the institution that I am representing today, but even our principles and values that the government has chosen to adopt as it becomes a digital government. So we have really laid out for all ministries, all government entities in how is it that we want to create this level of transformation and what is their role in the process? What is their responsibility? And what's the role and responsibility of our agency? And by doing so, then we can uh, hopefully create a more collaborative environment because there's clear 
understanding of rules and responsibilities, which as we know is very critical when we're trying to establish um, those collaborative relationships. Key features of our legal framework that we're very proud to say is that it's based on use trial model laws, it's based on GDPR frameworks, and of course, on UN conventions. So our, all our legislations are now um, up to par with global standards. So we've ensured as well that while we're doing this transformation process, that we always go back to understanding what is the global trends, what is the best practice, and how can we push forward in ensuring that we are also meeting them now. Another area when we talk about governance is policy. Uh, of course, you've heard already about our main policy being the national digital agenda, but the digital agenda also has other key policies that really support the implementation of the digital agenda and its principles. Um, earlier, you saw that one of our principles is to become a data-driven government. And in order to do so, we really need to understand once again, where we are, where we want to be. So we're currently working with the IDB to develop our national data strategy. And we're also working with them to implement our national identity strategy, which is a key digital public infrastructure that's necessary to be in place if we want to truly be a digital government. Now that we've heard about strategy, we've heard about governance, I really want to focus now on people and culture, uh, which I must say, I think is one of the most or the most critical uh, element of the transformation process. And many times is the element that we tend to forget. Um, we're great as institutions in ensuring that we implement strategy, we're always developing policies, we're always discussing reform and legislation, but many times we, we forget about talking and having a conversation about how we're going to support people and how we're going to support this culture shift that's necessary. Um, an organization, as I said earlier, is really driven by the internal culture and by its people. So we need to support people and culture in being part of this transformation process. In, in our case, we have taken a three-phase approach to supporting people and culture. Uh, we've started with the inside approach where we really looked at the organization, the e-governance and digitalization unit, and we assessed what were our challenges, what were our internal culture and our internal assumptions that were maybe a factors that were inhibiting our ability to really become those leaders and really become that support system for the rest of the government to embrace and to transform themselves internally. Um, so I'm proud to say that our unit has really um, embraced having an agile mindset and agile culture. And with that, we've really adopted new tools and approaches, as you can see there, that really has helped us to understand not just the challenges of our clients that we're trying to support, but to even improve our internal collaboration, to improve our internal communication, and to ensure that the products that we're delivering are of value and that they have met our clients' needs. So always putting our clients first is actually one of our, our first values within the unit. Apart from the unit needing to have that culture shift and that culture change, we also needed to have a discussion about how we're going to support our partners, being the government institutions, to also begin to have that culture shift. Um, as you saw earlier, our main challenge, again, was that we were still government-centric that we were still focusing on what was the challenges that we had as public officers. What is it that we needed and not what our clients needed or even who our clients were. You know, when we began to ask those questions, of who is your client? Who are you delivering the product for? Why are we designing this service? Is the service efficient? Is the service necessary? It really began to push public officers to begin to think uh, client first and then second. But that in itself was a challenge um, because we are asking them to think differently. And we realized in those conversations uh, that we were speaking two different languages. We were talking about digital transformation. We were talking about citizen centric. We were talking about user design, customer journey, uh, but they really didn't understand why we were saying it and why we were doing it. 
So we began to, to develop these courses, one, the first one being the digital transformation course, uh, which really gives an overview to public officers on what digital transformation is, what's the vision of government, how we're going to achieve it, what are some of the best practices, and what are going to be some of the new tools that would be implemented in this transformation process along with them. And actually having them do that practical exercise and to begin to build that camaraderie in really driving Belize's transformation forward. Um, we also in, adopted new additional courses like Data 101, because we're trying to push a culture of being data-driven, a culture of agility. So we provided those levels of trainings as well. Um, and in all of these cases, we really try to show them best the case studies in why this is very important and critical for them um, to be willing and able to, to adopt in this process. The third phase of supporting people and culture in our transformation process, of course, is our customers, it's our own people, and really empowering Belizeans to also be part of the conversation, to also be able to provide solutions to the challenges that they're having, and to be able to really provide meaningful insights when we're having these discussions with them, when we're having customer journey workshops that they can really tell us, you know, these are the challenges, this is how I think the solutions can be, and really drive the idea that this transformation process is a partnership uh, across the country. Now, one of those ways, and Mark uh, alluded to it earlier, was this Spotlight podcast. It's a podcast that we actually want the digital agenda and what were the key ways that the nation could be impacted and ways that they could become involved in the process and empowering them by giving them the full information of the national digital agenda of the country's vision in how we are going to transform lives. We've also planned other initiatives, you know, with currently planning the execution of digital literacy uh, for seniors because when we're talking about going online, unfortunately, there are certain segments of the population that will also become marginalized and we need to begin to do uh, mitigation and be prepared to ensure that we're not leaving no one behind. So we're designing those projects to ensure that there is also uh, increased digital literacy in seniors and of course also in women. Um, Girls in Tech webinar was our first initiative in bringing together um, trailblazing girls across the country to begin to have a discussion on what are the challenges that girls are facing um, in country in being able to participate in the ICT realm and what are solutions that they saw uh, for themselves that could be really implemented by government. So creating a platform where it's not government to citizen, but really citizens to citizens having a conversation of how they also want to see transformation within the country. And these are just additional programs that we have also done in building capacity and awareness um, in different areas of digital transformation, whether it be in cyber safety or even in creating um, knowledge on the legislation. These seven legislations are the digital world is expanding around us and new country. avenues for business, so social and personal interactions uh, are opening up. Comprehensive uh, capacity Stepping forward and public awareness campaign on all the legislation and, and all really developing guidelines as they carry out for each their day-to-day -day transactions and what online. it means, how it can be used by citizens and how it really protects them. As so really part of the digital transformation, in Belize, the government of Belize has partnered with the Compete Caribbean Partnership Facility to strengthen purpose. and introduce Because even for me, reading the National uh, Data Protection Act that's about 120 page is mind-blowing sometimes. Data so really protection transforming Act. that for our people. Electronic really Transaction driving Act. Driving home to them what is the key. Electronic uh, Funds Transfer Crime Act. That new legislation that provides Electronic Evidence them. Act. Uh, is very important Public that you're sector to data sharing act. These acts are further. The other segment, um, of course, is when we're talking about our customers, we need to talk about how we're going to create value for them and really taking the approach of being citizen centric. And as I indicated earlier, this just highlights 
um, some of the projects that we've done. Um, and why I highlighted it is because, as you heard earlier in Belize's context, we have 53% of rural population. And many of those populations do not have internet access today. And one of the key initiatives that we've implemented to be able to support and really provide and understand that context is developing a digital inclusion program uh, where we've now implemented digital connect centers within rural communities, uh, understanding that we have 44% of the population unbanked um, and, on the, and, not, and do not have a bank account, we needed to rethink in how we were going to create and support online payments for government services. Um, so we have actually piloted mobile wallets, which do not require um, individuals to have a bank account. So even now, the unbank can become part of the ecosystem and can interact with government online. In regards to processes and tech, uh, we've really went back to focusing on building the key blocks for digital government, um, and that being having a very robust civil registry, because without a civil registry, then it's difficult to have a national ID, and a national ID is critical when we're talking not just about delivering online services, but even being able to provide effective and efficient services overall, and to ensure that it supports the initiatives across government. Uh, another key building block is improving our digital payment ecosystem. While we've adopted mobile wallets, we want to really understand whether it has effectively supported the unbanked and interacting with government, or is there another means that we need to look at another innovation that might help to better support them accessing government services. So understanding the entire ecosystem that exists so that we can build these key, key pillars and strengthen them to support having a digital government. And of course, that government becomes a platform for a digital economy. Throughout this entire process, I must say uh, that one of the key success factors has been building allies. As you can see there, we have allies internally, we have externally, we even have regionally. And this has been critical in accelerating Belize's digital transformation process because we cannot achieve it alone. In fact, we're not legal experts. We're not experts in social protection, in social systems. We're not experts in payment systems. So we need to take a collaborative approach at all times to ensure that we're delivering the best service, the best quality, and that we're delivering solutions that are really tailored to the needs of our citizens. And that requires strong partnerships and that requires being open and having open dialogues such as these to really share information, but to also learn. So, um, you know, I must thank all my allies over the last two years and who've really helped us in pushing forward Belize's national digital agenda. Having put in place those enabling conditions and build those allies over the last two years, I'm very proud to say that when we, we look at the digital agenda from a project implementation uh, measure, we are 44% in execution phase, uh, which is pretty much almost double from the previous policy. So it really, for us, further motivates us to continue working and building on those enabling conditions. But it really shows that it's critical that we continue in driving this new way of digital transformation so that we can see, um, if not maybe 100%, but very close to it in achieving Belize's digital agenda and its vision for it for the first four years of becoming a digital Belize. Um, some of our lessons learned over the last two years, because there's always lessons learned, uh, this process is a process of learning. Uh, we won't always get it perfect, but we try to ensure that we are always learning and making those necessary changes as part of the culture that the unit embraces, which is agility. Um, there are six main areas that we would always recommend to avoid, as we like to say uh, locally, no gotta market twice don't repeat the mistakes Why is really focusing on user design approach, really having that conversation with citizens and understanding uh, their challenges, their pain points in accessing services, their pain points in the journey process, so that when we're redesigning these processes, redesigning system, that we're also addressing those pain points. And we're not creating the same challenges that exist in the physical realm, in the digital realm. 
um, ensuring as well that we begin to use data. As you saw from the very beginning, I began with statistics. I began with understanding the data because the data helps us to understand how to deliver better products and how to design those products without having understood that our country has 44% um, on bank population, we would have probably wanted to implement um, e-commerce solutions like debit cards and credit cards as payment options for government services. But now that we understand that we have such a large on bank population, and even so that the credit card penetration in country, I think it's less than 10%, then it begins to help you to understand that that's maybe not the best solution to be implementing within the country. So data utilization is critical in this process if we really want to ensure that we're, we're designing products that are accurate and that are really addressing the challenges at hand. Having that common vision, not just on paper, not just in an agenda, not just in a strategy, but a vision that's truly incorporated in the culture of the organizations. Um, in the case of the unit, we really like to say that we like to lead by example. Um, you're never gonna see a piece of paper on my table, for example. You're never gonna see us walk with paper. And that sends a very clear message um, to all government entities that this is the way we're going to move and that there is leadership, there's support, and there's that drive for that transformation. And that's what people want to see. People become inspired when we begin to set the example, when we begin to drive that motivation. So having that common vision and that common language is critical in this transformation process. Um, having an agile mindset, understanding that we need agility, we need that flexibility, and we need to focus on delivering products to our users. Change management, um, again, going back to people and culture and how do we support people in adapting to this new way of doing things? How do we support that culture shift? How do we prepare them for that culture shift? And how does the unit begin to embrace change management approaches for us to support that transformation process? In fact, we're currently in the process of designing a change management toolkit for the unit and um, building capacity in the unit as change agents so that we can effectively support everyone when we're transforming. Because change is not easy. Change is, is the unknown and we don't like the unknown. So we need to help people in feeling safe and comfortable and trusting the process of really moving from what we know today to a new desired future, which is an unknown to them. So change management is very important in this process. And we've had the support of our partner in the UNDP in really building capacity uh, within the unit. And lastly, we've learned a lot from our partnerships. Uh, like I said, it's critical that you build those allies so that you learn from their experiences but as well to be able to access resources. And I don't only mean financially, but also technical resources and support because we are not the experts in everything. Um, it's impossible. And we need to be able to tap into um, experiences, expertise from across the region to be able to support us in really driving um, Belize's transformation plan. So these are six main lessons learned for us in the last two years that we have uh, really pushed forward in further creating that enabling condition for Belize's vision. And overall, I must say um, that our recipe in this transformation process, uh, I think you've heard me say a lot is ensuring that we have that vision, that we have that leadership and aligned ecosystem, that we have that holistic strategy and roadmap this is critically important. Um, we cannot expect that by giving someone in government a strategy that they would know how to implement in practice, that they clearly understand from year lens, what are some of the assumptions and some of the areas that they need to implement. You really need to provide the guidance in developing that roadmap, that action plan of the steps that we all need to take collectively so that we can actually execute. Um, strong governance, governance not just in the sense of legal framework, policy, institution, but also leadership. Um, that as a ministry, we are leaders in driving and supporting that transformation change and that we become the example and we inspire and motivate our colleagues across government. And then lastly, resources and 
partnerships. I cannot overemphasize the importance of partnerships in this transformation process, uh, not just internal partnerships, but externally, as we try to create that complete organizational shift for the country in moving it from being an analog to a digital Belize. So overall, um, this has really helped us to drive that change. And we're proud to say that um, we are now ranked at 133. And for the first time, we have moved from the middle to the high EGDI group. So in the last two years, we've had that three point um, improvement in that ranking. And it's again, a clear sign an inspiration for us to continuing to do the work that we do, but it also shows that there that we have the capacity to create the change internally, uh, because the same team that supported this transformation process, or about eighty percent of the same team that supported it over ten years ago, is the same team that we're working with. But we have changed our culture, we've changed our approach, and we've also create these enabling conditions, which has helped us to really improve Belize's international performance and begin to drive change within our country. So it is possible. Um, we have the internal capacity. We just need to continue pushing forward and supporting all key areas of that digital transformation approach that we've focused on, which is of course, strategy, governance, people and culture, our customers, and lastly, processes. So with that said, I would really like to thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to Belize's transformation story. I hope that you have been able to really learn from us and that you're open in the next session of Q&A in also sharing some of the experiences that you've had in your transformation journey, because we're always welcome um, and we're always eager to learn more. So thank you very much. And if you want to continue learning more about our transformation process, please feel free uh, to go to our website at digitalagenda.gov.bz. Thank you so much to everyone. And Mark, I'll pass it on to you now. Thank you so much, Alexia, for this presentation and showing us the process, the, the, the steps that have been taken to, to really pull Belize into the middle and high, and, and high category in terms of the index. Um, it's just, it, 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 what I've seen is the focus on people. And that is so, it's so critical. Like, I mean, we can create all the policies and legislation, but if the people are not there to pull the process, then it will never work. So thank you. At this point in time, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the presence of the Honorable Davidson Ismail, the Minister of Industry, Innovation, Science and Technology of the Government of Barbados. Minister Ishmael, welcome to the Canter Conversations. Thank you for being present. And I can say on behalf of the Board of Canter, you have really been a true stalwart in the region in terms of representing and standing by what the organization entails. And we thank you for joining us this morning. So everyone, the, at the, I mean, I was, I was looking for questions, but I do have a couple for myself, which I think may stimulate um, may stir the pot, uh, as, as, as you would say, uh, with the region. So, Alexia, I, you know, in listening to what you have stated in terms of the, you know, the, the, the transformative journey, and I saw it coming from, in terms of an analog journey coming into the, what is GovTech, and funny enough, it is pretty much similar to where um, it mirrors, in a sense, I, the ITU's way or the, 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 the G's of regulation. So it comes now to a point of customer centricity. What, how has been the uptake of, the, of, um, of persons, of your clients and the various sectors that you have seen? Like what has been the, um, the, the, the movement on the ground? Um, thank you so much, Mark. I think that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is that it has been a bit difficult for our customers to really embrace um, that approach. We have went from traditional models of developing system, which mm -hmm. in project management terms is waterfall approach, where you speak to the client at the beginning of the project, you, you have one or two sessions with them, 
Then you go into your corner, you build that product and you come nine months later and say, here, see the product. This is what you asked me for. And that's that, that point that we realize or the client realizes, you know, I didn't want that or I preferred it in a different manner or that doesn't work for me. And you go back to the drawing board and you do the process again. Um, while now we are taking more a scrum approach uh, where we include the client at every step of that development process. Mm -hmm. At every point we have checks with them, we have bi-weekly meetings with them to really get their inputs into the product that's being designed. And that it was a challenge to get them um, to adapt to that process. One, because they saw it as, um, do you want me to have more meetings with you? And as public employees, uh, I guess we're, we're fatigued of meetings. Um, so they really didn't want to have those additional sessions. But it also means that they begin to have a critical role in this process, in developing this product, because they need to take ownership of the product um, and they need to drive how that product is designed and implemented. So that culture shift, that mind shift in how we develop products, I must say, uh, was difficult um, in being embraced in the public sector. Um, but of course, that's why having the agile training was critical for us in implementing, because then we begin to explain to them why this is important, why it's critical, and how it's going to really make life easier for them. Because of instead of spending two years trying to design a product with us, you might spend half of that and actually get a product that really works for you. So it has been challenging, um, but we've been working on trying to support that buy-in from our customers into the process. And, 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 and it's funny, Alexia, because I, you know, I have seen where, you know, different governments have created, you know, they have created ministries or units, you know, and, and, and but I, what I've found and what has I found to be so exciting about Belize is that you actually, you have the unit and then on top of that, as I said, and you have spoken about it, your podcast, because there are different ways to reach different demographics. And what that is what I'd like to I'd like put Belize on the spot on now in terms of we as a, as a, as a region have to find different ways, not just the as you would say, the out of the box um, solutions that that um that consultancy companies will give us and say, yes, this is what you need to do. This is legislation you need to implement, and therefore this is what you need to this is what you need to do. You have actually found something, found Belizean Belizeans voice. Belizeans are telling the story to Belizeans that the only and that's the way they will know it in terms of being able to do the change. So I really have to put um commend you on that. And to a point of commendation to the next question, um, the next question being raised, I would like to acknowledge um, the, a for, the former counter chairman, former counter director, Julian Winkins, who actually has his hand up um, to uh, ask a question or to speak on the floor. Julian? Yes, uh, sorry about that. I... I just had a challenge uh, unmuting there. Um, Alexia, um, Mark, thank you very much for that, uh, for those nice words there. But Alexia, very good uh, presentation. Uh, I love the way that you've uh, taken you. us through the whole, the whole process. That was excellent work that you've done over the past uh, couple of years. I have two questions for you. Um, one is, uh, was uh, your your digital transformation course was this designed internally and if so how did you go about it and two are you coming to Canto in Miami because <laughs> I'd like to meet um, you if you are if you are coming to Miami I'd love to meet you I'll, I'll take the first question and then I'll I'll also ask Mark to help me in the second one <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much, uh, Mr. Julian. So in regards to the digital transformation course, it was actually designed with the UNDP and the ITU. Um, they had already designed the main course. And what we did was we adopted the course and we actually implemented a practical element to the exercise. Um, so on a weekly basis, the cohorts would meet together to be able to implement 
exercises in doing analysis of organizations and implementing a digital readiness tool in um, assessing processes. So we really wanted them to not just learn the, um, the knowledge or the information of digital transformation, but how can they implement it practically to design digital transformation plans for ministries. So they were um, actually responsible to choose a ministry and to actually implement that transformation process as a first phase for the ministry. So it's, it's a course that's actually open um, from the UNDP and the ITU that they are always willing to share with other countries to adopt it. And from our end, we're really open to sharing how we have designed the practical element of the course and how we can support in uh, lending those tools to countries so that they can also do these pilot digital transformation courses. Um, in regards to your question about Canto, of course, I, I would love to be there and to be able to, to meet you as well and to meet all the participants that will be there and to really have those conversations that helps us to further build, build our collaboration network. Um, unfortunately, Julia and um, Alexia won't be, won't be able to attend, um, which is why I really wanted her to actually speak on this because it's going to be a central focus of of the of the conference and then into into the into 2024 i'd hope that it's something that we focus on to watch how different governments um embrace the change that is that is needed for us to be able to truly advance as a region um just to close on the final question um if there are no other questions from 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 anyone is um alexia and it's some this is what initially had drawn my attention to you which was your digital governance act and I remember because to me it seems to be the umbrella of the umbrella piece of the legislation. And to also look at what had happened, like the legislative agenda of Belize was at a blistering pace, like 20, through 2020 to 2022, we saw approximately, and I'll count it, eight pieces of legislation passed to facilitate this. And you know, normally when you pass, you have to go through the various, you have to go to the floor, special committee you know, get the public consultation. So this really is commendable. But if just, just to close, close under the umbrella and under the shade of Belize, <laughs> speak it to your national motto, um, can you speak more on the Digital Governance Government Act and what it entails and just, just to close in terms of it being a central piece of legislation and the framework of what you're doing? No, I mean, as you rightfully said, you know, the Digital Government Act is the umbrella legislation for the country, um, apart from having a strong policy that really guides us and really uh, shares how we as a country are going to achieve this transformation and what are the roles and responsibilities. We recognize as well that if we wanted to make the transformation of Belize sustainable, if we wanted it to be really a part of the way the government operates, and it's not just a one-off type of initiative where by the end of four years, we say, well, we're done, we're completed, but that digital transformation is a core activity that we continuously do um, and becomes part of who Belize is, then we also needed to enshrine um, this process into our legal framework to ensure that there would always have that sustainability, that it would always have the necessary institution by legally establishing the Ministry of E-Governance, establishing the Department of E-Governance to establishing the roles and responsibilities of the Ministry of the Department, and also, um, also establishing the responsibilities of ministries. So the Digital Government Act actually also stipulates that as all units governments, we will have to take services online. We will have to do continuous review of services on a yearly basis. Uh, we will have to be able to integrate into one government platform. We have to share information. We have to make our systems interoperable. So the government, Digital Government Act also highlights those high level architecture principles that defines Belize's uh, digital government approach and really defines who is responsible for who in this transformation process. So it's very clear and it's very clear that when we're having conversations with each other, then we know where these responsibilities lie. Um, and the Digital Government Act also 
uh, clearly highlights that the government's principle is in creating greater efficiency, greater effectiveness, and reducing bureaucracy um, in service delivery, because it even speaks to one's only principle. Uh, and if you've ever seen countries like Estonia, those principles are actually the backbone of those countries also being uh, leaders in becoming digital government. So in the design of our Digital Government Act, we also look at examples of the United States. We look um, in South America, we looked in Europe, and we really tried to create that umbrella legislation that ensures that it has clearly stipulated legally what is the principles that we will drive forward in becoming a digital government and ensuring that sustainability overall. Um, and we're now designing a digital law action plan uh, to actually highlight the key activities that will be implemented to enforce the legislation. Um, as you know, from your background, it's one thing to pass the legislations and to implement the legislations. It's another to actually embed those principles into the operations um, of each, each ministry and unit. So we're designing the digital law action plan for all the legislations, in fact, um, highlighting the key activities that will ensure that these legislations are put to practice and that we ensure that they become part of uh, the way government believe, operates and of course part of our DNA and it, in, it is the main enabling condition for the work that we do. Thank you so much, Alexia. And just, just for the presentation today and also just the, what I'm seeing coming out of the Digital Government Act is accountability. So the government yes. is willing to hold itself accountable to exactly. meet certain milestones to be able to facilitate this process. Because as I said, you can always, as you have said, you can always have the policy, but the customers, and that is, that is, that is what it comes back to, the customers, the people, the process, the partners, you know, and those, that, that is the, that's what I'd like for us to close on in terms of our, in terms of the comments or to close this segment, you know, peace, persistence, you know, Belize, you started in 2015, 2018, you 2015 to 2018, you were at 25% in terms of an execution. Now you're at now you're at 44 and increasing. Your your position on the index has improved over the last two years, but over the last three years by 30%. So in terms of the rate of growth and implementation and uptake, it has been phenomenal. And I think it just comes back to the central focus of having having the law work for the people in the time that it is necessary to, to, to move. And as, as you said, it is a process. There are steps being taken, but again, your approach, process, and the focus on the people is key. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Alexia Peralta, the director of the e-governance and digitization unit of the government of Guyana, has just presented on digitalization of Caribbean governance and the process and the steps taken in Belize. Thank you, Alexia. Thank you for your time this morning on behalf of the Canto organization and the board of directors. Thank you guys this morning for joining. Be sure to register for our 30th annual conference and trade exhibition at JW Marriott, Miami, Turnberry, Tur and, to, and please make sure to book your accommodation as our hotel, hotel booking deadline is approaching on June 29. Please visit canto, www.canto.org. Guys, it is going to be one not to miss because our all of our boots have been sold out in record time. Um, it, has, it has just been very, 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 the, the, the support and overwhelming um, push to make this event a success. And even the 20th, 24 has been supported by you, the members, you in attendance, and this area of digitalization of Caribbean government is going to be a key theme going throughout the three days as to how do we pivot as a society and looking to our leaders um, to aid this process and for there to be partnership and consensus. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you in Miami and looking forward to seeing you virtual, virtually. Have a great day, have a great week. Keep safe and keep dry in the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you, Alexia.